welcome everyone to this uh, second part of um, the class on human activity recognition to um, the use of uh, IMUs. Uh, this second lecture is uh, particularly concentrating on techniques uh, that are a bit more um, advanced and recent um, with respect to machine learning, in particular deep learning. And I'll give you some examples of, um, of that, but also I'll try to justify why you what, what what the challenges are in using this sort of techniques for this type of data. So we'll start with a simple um, let's say translation of what has been done in uh, deep learning uh, in the general area of imaging. Deep learning has uh, boomed a few years ago and has shown a particularly good performance in most of most of the cases in um, images and video applications. And so um, in activity recognition, the first thing that has been tried was to uh, bring these techniques to the data and see if it was able to beat uh, existing traditional machine learning based on what we discussed um, in the last lecture, beyond feature extraction and classification. And so here is a reference from uh, 2014 that um, uses uh, traditional um, <laughs> deep learning approaches. So here you see um, a graph from the paper that has um, the various, um, so if you use accelerometer data, for example, you have X, Y, and Z axis input, row data, consider these are not features, this is row data fed into uh, what they're called convolutional um, neural networks. And these are networks that are very, very good at extracting features from the data automatically. Um, they are not uh, the traditional um, fully connected deep learning neural networks, uh, but they're based on the idea of using kernels, uh, which are essentially matrices, over the space of the data to identify features. And they do this progressively. So there are various layers of it. Um, the max pooling layer here is an operation that creates a down sample feature map because these convolutions generate lots of, lots of features over the space of the data. And so the max pooling is used to compress this uh, to a smaller um, scale feature map. The hidden layer are fully connected uh, traditional machine learning um, neural network layers. And the softmax classifier is essentially um, you know, a, a classifier like we have seen in the last lecture, but it calculates probabilities for each class, um, which um, is what is then used to um, decide on the classification um, generally. So these techniques um, have turned out to um, be useful and uh, usable very much for um, activity recognition directly, okay? So, so they can be applied um, and um, you know, until here, there is really no novelty. You can apply this sort of techniques to the data. Now, what we know of the data is that the data is, um, you've seen it, right? We were using windows um, to, to, to shift the window to try to find the activity and then look at the temporal dimension of these. And so here uh, in another approach that has been used more recently, um, the, the feeding of um, the neural network contains a slice that contains the three input X, Y, and Z for that particular time, and then sliding that down um, to further. So you have, you have time here on one of the axes. And so again, here you have a few convolutional layers, um, but the data that we feed is slightly uh, different with respect to the previous one. And these dense layers are actually um, what are called recurrent um, neural networks. And uh, they help um, with the time series aspects of the data, the fact that there are dependencies from, um, you know, this, the space-time dimension somehow, um, that the data is not a single point. And uh, this approach, then you have a softmax layer as, as before, but this approach turns out to be quite useful um, in helping finding the features. And then um, these dense recurrent layers are helping understanding um, the data better. So it turns out that, I think this is kind of uh, where the, uh, the traditional application of machine learning to existing 
um, labeled, I should emphasize because the second part of the lecture will concentrate on how you can improve from label data. Um, on the label data, this is probably the best example, one of the best examples of architecture that um, works. Now, um, the, and this is, this is a, a graphical representation of why this uh, works well, again, from the same paper. So here is, you have um, the ground truth um, on the first row. And you see the activities, which are different colors, and you see the colors represented. So this this red one um, is probably drink from cup or toggle switch. I can't quite match the red. Let's say it's toggle switch it looks a bit uh, more um, darker. And then you have an activity which is open door one. I think it's a purple. And then you have a blue closed door one and then you have other activities of different colors later. So in the ground truth, obviously, on the y-axis is the, the probability of this being um, the action. And so you have um, one when the action is at the top here. Um, so essentially, this is the max of the action. This is really the action of opening. This is closing. So you recognize the activity really well. This is the ground truth. This is the data we have. And um, the dash line is the null um, class. So if you use a normal, um, just normal convolutional neural network layers without this uh, LSTM aspects, um, then this is the performance of the approach. And it's, it's quite good. At least you recognize the null class from the various other activity. But you see that there are some probabilities of other classes emerging at this stage. And this probability of red doesn't get very much high here. Um, here is confusing opening to closing. Here is confusing, um, I think, closing of a different door, uh, which I guess, I, I suppose, is actually a different, difficult thing to do. And um, this is how, um, and this is um, also not very clear here, for example this action here, which is close dishwasher possibly, open dishwasher, I imagine, um, is not very recognized. Instead, uh, the approach used by this model, which is here, sorry, my mouse is just switched back, um, is quite good at recognizing which door was open and closed, and um, then uh, recognizing the various activities, there is no, no other color here, which tells you that actually they're quite good at recognizing the activity. So this dependency, this um, temporal dependency has helped improving the performance. So I said it before um, that, yes, this is just an application of existing machine learning, existing deep learning to a different data set, time series data set. Well, so what's new here? Why is there anything to learn about uh, new machine learning techniques for this data. Well, actually, it's quite interesting because um, unlike other uh, domains, sensor data um, is difficult to label. Um, and there are not many large-scale labeled data sets to try things on. Uh, there are lots of unlabeled data sets, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that. So uh, having, think about it, um, how do you collect data about um, someone moving, which activities they are doing, for example? Well, you have to either observe, get video data, match the video data, or have an observer all the time. And then you have to the timestamp alignment between the, the ground truth and the sensor data itself. It's actually quite difficult to do this in large scale. So it is difficult to collect large scale ground truth. It is difficult to um, label the data even if you had the money to collect this data. And if you do have a small data set, then your deep neural network approaches, which generally have a very large number of parameters, will uh, probably memorize the data rather than learn the generalization characteristics. So they, these approaches tend to overfit, meaning learning the characteristics of the data which are not generalizable beyond this data set, and so learn nothing about actually the process itself of the classification task you have in mind. And so there are various solutions um, that are starting to emerge in the literature in recent years on how to solve this problem uh, for, for machine learning, for uh, human activity recognition, accelerometer data in general. 
These are related generally to semi-supervised learning, self-learning, self-training, transfer learning. I'll give you some example and explain uh, most of these terms in the next part of the lecture. So um, the idea of semi-supervised learning um, involves the use of a small number of labeled examples and a large number of unlabeled examples. And so, so here is the question. You have a, a small data set that has labels and you're trying to see if you can apply deep learning to it uh, but then you know that if you don't have enough data to make it work because it's overfitting and uh, you can't learn all the parameters of the network. So can the unlabeled data that you have, and there's lots of it, um, think about us um, going around with our phones. Our phones are collecting um, activity data, accelerometer data all the time, but this is unlabeled. Um, we just have that data, but it's not labeled. And can that help? The process of classifying um, data um, improving the classification task of, of some other data. So, if you have so, so the idea here is you have some small labeled data set and you have a large unlabeled data set. Can the large labeled data set improve the classification task on the small uh, data set? And so, if you if you only have the uh, the label data, this is uh, the figure on the top. Well, you can only really have a boundary that is uh, very, very rough um, over the data space, right? Instead, if you start having the gray samples at the bottom, um, you start being able to distinguish the data with patterns that are a bit more advanced. This is just a, a mathematical, <laughs> let's say a graphical representation or mathematical concept of where you can put your boundary in your classifier. And you might have seen this concept before. But the idea, the intuition is that the unlabeled data will help you um, find these boundaries better. And I'll, I'll give you some examples of um, what, has been, um, what has been done in this uh, domain. And I think uh, there are about three examples of it. So this first one is what we call um, convolutional neural network encoder decoder. The idea here is that um, we have a small data set of labeled data, and we have a large data set of unlabeled data. And by feeding the unlabeled data in the training process, um, we are able to improve the weight find it. So the training process of a deep neural network is essentially a way to find uh, better weights in the network so that we can, when you are in, in the testing phase and you uh, are using your model, then the model has the, is, is trained appropriately, the weights are perfect and you have good performance. So that's the idea. So here, um, you, if you look at just this column here, you have your usual, you've seen it before in the previous slides, you have some or one convolutional layer, the max pooling layer, which reduces, and at a fully connected layer at the end, and the soft max. Okay, so you passed your, let's say initially you have your uh, label data, you pass it in for training, and eventually the soft max layer will be able to use the labels to um, then calculate those probabilities, and all this will be trained and find the weights. If you pass through this, the unlabeled data, well, you won't be able to use it here because you don't have the label. So um, how, so the, the question that this paper kind of solves is how can you use the unlabeled data to improve the weight finding in the training phase? And that's, that's what you're trying to do. Um, and so um, this approach essentially um, is one where the data they pass here, label and unlabel, is add, to it is added, so each layer is kind of adding some noise to the data, and then the um, the unlabeled data is passed to another set of layers, which are um, used to uh, determine the noise. So understanding the noise that was introduced on the data. So is that kind of a discrimination um, set of layer that is able to say uh, what noise was added to this data, and by improving um, this essentially, the, uh, by, by using this kind of set of layers here, 
um, then this this process essentially helps the training of the layers um, and the identification of the weights in the system. Um, so by by using this kind of and you will see in the next slides as well that essentially we are tricking we are we are kind of finding an auxiliary task here by saying well we now want to um, use the unlabeled data to see if the system can determine when the data is noisy and when it's not noisy well that also means that we are um, adding some information um, about the unlabeled data in the system, even if we know what the label are, at least um, the recognition of this kind of data by the network is enough to improve the performance. And in fact, um, this approach shows that the performance uh, improves. So these are three examples of um, data sets uh, on which this is applied. Um, we are going to ignore the black line because I haven't talked about this other approach, but um, the purple line is the approach we've talked about. The red line here is the approach that uses, um, so here the aim is to say, uh, we have a data set and we have uh, a number of uh, labels and what are our performance with this data set? Now, um, in this particular case, just to prove that the performance were good, it, it just so happens that the user had available a data set with lots and lots of labels, so a large label data set. But in practice, we know that we don't want in practice to have this because it's very costly to uh, label data. So, um, you know, the, 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 the red line is one that has the best performance, but we really want to do this with less labels than that. And so, in fact, here uh, on the X axis, you have how many labels are the, approach, the purple approach and the normal CNN approach um, heavy. And we see that um, the purple line is improving quite well. And when you have about 500, you're already above 65. Um, F1 score, F1 score we've seen in the first lecture, what this means is a combination of precision and recall. Um, and so um, just with much less labels, even just with a simple CNN, in fact, I should say, um, you can already um, improve the performance. Um, and this this is an approach that is quite useful. As long as you have more data, just having more data in the system to train, even if you can't use the felt max, it's, it's quite useful already. And this is a great result. It tells you that um, you can have less data labeled and still with the large data set, which is unlabeled, you can help your performance. Um, here is another um, example of um, how this can be done. So if you have a large unlabeled data set, you can generate even more um, data by transforming the data. Uh, in this particular case, they create a type of transformation. You include some sort of uh, you know, Gaussian noise, uh, rotation of the data, scaling of the data, negation of the data, permutation of time, um, time warping of the data, uh, things like this to the data that is able to generate more data that is similar to the original data set, but slightly different. And then they generate a, um, a temporal neural network uh, similar to the structure that uh, we, have, we, have, we have described before that have CNN layer and uh, recurrent neural network layers to be able to um, distinguish, and they have some task specific layer, be able to distinguish which kind of transformation has been applied to the data. And so um, this task is just, if you think about it, all it does, the classification task here is de describing if the data has been transformed and which transformation has been applied. So this model will be trained to on just unlabeled data to distinguish a transformation, right? So, so once you understand that, we can go further. Now, uh, in this picture, you see this dashed line. That means that we take this model that has been trained this way, and let's say we freeze it, meaning we, we don't change anything in the weights of the model, and we test it, so we use it to 
let's say we have a small labeled activity recognition data set and we use it to classify activities. How would that perform? So notice that this model has been trained on lots and lots of data, but it wasn't trained on the classification of activity, it was trained on the classification of finding the transformation. Okay. And here are some results. Um, and I, I have to say one more thing before we can get to results. If you look at, okay, this, these panels are for different data sets. And um, this is uh, for HAR, which is a different data. So they tried it on different data because um, you, you, know, you want to be able to generalize, say that your approach can be generalized. And so here are the results. Um, on the x-axis, you have a training instances per class. So how many labels really um, are you using per class? And the one is the supervised approach. The supervised approach is one that just relies on the data that is labeled. So the small data set that you have. The other two are the approaches I've just defined, except that the last one is essentially a, um, has been fine-tuned, meaning, I'll go back one slide, um, that this, this one, I said it would be frozen, meaning all the weights will be considered. But here we are freezing a few layers and retraining that, um, those, those weights for those layers on an activity recognition task so that uh, we are essentially intuitively showing the network what an activity recognition task is. Um, that's all we're doing. So the, the architecture is still the same. Most of the weights are the same. Um, just a few things uh, change in this uh, fine tune. I noticed that on the uh, y-axis, we have this uh, Cohen Kappa instead of F1. It's essentially an F1, but it's a bit more robust and balanced. If you want, you can read about this. Um, and uh, it works quite well for this, but the paper also has the F1 results if you want to see them. Um, but here, essentially, um, the important thing is the blue line is lower generally, and the other two lines are doing quite well with quite a small number of instances per class. Um, and so, you know, we are doing uh, better for a few instances per class in terms of classification tasks. And uh, yeah, so, so that's one of the results. A little variation of this um, is uh, what's called a teacher-student model. And I wanted to show you that because although being quite similar, um, it, has, uh, it, has, it has a model that has been used quite um, much in deep learning. So this is the full architecture. We'll go back to it, uh, but I'll first describe the various components one at a time so that you understand uh, the idea. And you can read, obviously, in the paper if you want more details of this. So um, first we assume, again, we have a, a small, reasonably small label data set. So you have your data, you have your label. We split it for training and testing, obviously, because uh, some we'll have to use to, to show that our approach is useful. Um, and on the training data set, we train a model that is essentially has some core component and some, um, some uh, deep neural network um, fully connected layer. And we use this here. Where do we use it? We use it with a large unlabeled data set, again, of a row accelerometer measure. And this is just this box here that also contains some of the training, some of the labeled data. So here, this purple box is unlabeled data plus some training labeled data that comes from here. So it's part of the screen one. This component here is also used here. Um, and so this is the model. And then uh, we just use this model here and we look at the softmax prediction confidence. So as you know, um, here for this data, we don't have the label. And so how do we, how do we decide um, on which data to keep here? Well, we look at uh, the probabilities and prediction confidence that the softbox generates, and we only keep the ones that are really uh, reasonably high for, for those classes. And, and so that, that kind of discards the bad data somehow, the data which we are very uncertain about. And, but notice, you know, this is um, kind of a phase of training and we don't have, uh, because we don't have the labels, we don't have the ground tools. So this is a way to dis describe what to discard. What do we do with this? Uh, well, remember, our aim is to um, 
improve the performance over the um, over the data of the um, you know this testing set, this um, label data set that we have. And so um, let's go down here. So this is the data that is coming from the top here. So we take this data with the confidence that we generated. So this says already somehow the classes are associated to this data by this model. And we only keep the ones that have high confidence so the probabilities are high. What do we do with that? Well, we do the thing that the other approach, the previous approach I explained has done, which is we generate transformations as well. So um, we take the labels, we take the transformation and we augment the data. Now we have this data plus the data with the augmentations. And we do what the other approach is doing. We have a, a student model, a model, that um, has various tasks for the various uh, classifications. Um, these are the various uh, noise flip. We can we recognize that the data has been flipped, that the data has, had, has been had been had the noise, but we also have a task that recognizes the activity. So these are multitask classification on this data that contains both the original just um, HIR data on the labeled and label side and the noise transformation. And so now we have a model that is able to do all these things. And we just take this part of the model, um, which is more trained more widely with all these other tasks, but we only take the one that um, gives the HAR classification. We freeze it partially, we fine tune it on our data, and then we use it to classify activity recognition data that we have. And it turns out that this is better than just using um, just a model that has been trained on simply the classification tasks that we saw, um, you know, the, just, just the existing data. So this is better. And in fact, here is an example of the performance of this. And um, so this is again, a fully supervised approach means in that we are only using the data that has labels. So um, generally it's not much data here. And here is an approach that uses um, self AR, this, this approach, the screen approach, and this is the approach that only uses the transformation. So we don't use any of the other unlabeled data um, approach, just the transformation bit. The transformation bit is helping a lot. We knew that from the previous approach, but this other green, there's another improvement of performance added by this other uh, more complex approach. And these are three data sets that you see here. So here, until now, what have we learned? We have learned that, um, so the first part of the lecture was um, saying, yes, traditional deep learning approaches applied to HAR have been quite useful. Um, they have uh, shown good performance. There are some architectures that work better than others because they contain spatial temporal aspects, uh, especially the recurrent neural networks. Uh, last layers have been a good addition for HAR data, for accelerometer data. Um, but given that there are generally very small data set labeled, can we do something with all the unlabeled data that exists in HAR? And I've shown you three examples of that. So now I want to generalize more from um, um, the use of just activity recognition to something that is more related to health, uh, but still uses deep learning approaches to improve um, recognition. So um, an application of cell supervision um, to the area of cardiorespiratory fitness. So um, I don't know how many of you have um, had one of these tests, but this is a quite invasive test to measure your cardiorespiratory fitness. Cardiorespiratory fitness is very important for cardiovascular health. It's very related to it. And cardiovascular health is very um, a, a, an important prediction factor of um, of how we live and uh, of disease. So it's important to have a cardiorespiratory fitness um, estimator generally in our health. However, doing it with this sort of machines, it doesn't scale and is actually, um, it's very exhausting to um, go on these machines and uh, breathe into this, um, this, this systems. Um, the way this is done is that um, they, what, what one measure is the what's so called VO2 max, which is the amount of oxygen that is breathed in and then transformed into energy in our muscles. And um, to do that, uh, they have to do this. However, there are proxies for that um, that are related to um, 
how much our heart rate changes during activity. And this has been often um, used, uh, for example, people have been asked how many, um, how much have you moved today and what's your heart rate? And, and by this estimators, often we can go and uh, improve the way in which we, um, which we predict cardiorespiratory fitness. So um, one of the studies that have been done with uh, free living data on cardiorespiratory fitness is that, um, let's say there's a data set um, it's called Fenland One of uh, about 10,000 people that have been followed over 10 years, seven years, and a smaller number of them have been um, given data. What kind of data was collected on this, um, this set is, uh, well, yeah, on, on the visit on day one, they did what this VO2 max test, which is the one I described in the previous uh, picture. Uh, they've also been given anthropometric measures, meaning age, statistics uh, about how they um, age, gender, um, this sort of information. And they've also asked questionnaires about their health. And then they've been given a device that monitored their movement and their heart data. So acceleration and heart data for six days. And so um, in this study in practice, uh, the acceleration data and the heart data was used with a deep learning approach to, um, in fact, it was uh, just a few layers of, a few dense layers of connecting neural networks to predict the fitness of the individual, which we know this is the ground truth, right? We have the ground truth and to see if this could be predicted just by using movement and heart. And it also, um, there are other, other partners, um, other, um, sorry, um, tasks that have been used to infer the fitness um, after seven years and um, check if the model was generalizable. I will only talk about the first one because it's the one that probably tells us more about an application of this kind of uh, deep neural network model to help cardiorespiratory health and with accelerometer data. And so uh, let's look at the picture first. So this is the VO2 max, so the fitness level, um, which is measured in this, um, on this line. And uh, we see here that overall, the prediction of the deep learning model was quite good. It was underfitting, underestimating for um, this range here. But generally, you see the two curves are quite are kind of similar. So this is the distribution of the O2 max, so the original and the distribution of the O2 max of um, the predicted. In the in the picture above, you can see that just so this is. Um, just using a regression task that measures the coefficient uh, to the correlation and the root mean square error of the prediction, essentially. So the anthropometric measure, which are just using the measures of age, sex, and weight, had a, a, a kind of prediction score. But actually, um, this is much improved by using the wearable sensor data plus a resting heart rate plus the anthropometric measure. So using all this measure plus the wearable data was the best performance. And this is the error on the mean square error of the real to max um, that was really taken down um, with respect to that. So what we learned here is actually by using this sort of data, we are improving the prediction. Now, because we talked about um, the examples I've given you before um, on embedding, uh, sorry, on um, on using uh, a task for prediction that is not the final task that we are aiming to uh, to work on. So, for example, we were using transformations to train a model that was predicting transformation, was the data transformed, but then we used it to do uh, an activity recognition task prediction, right? We fine tuned it and used it there. We, we, we had two examples of this. And this is actually a similar, a similar model of that. So um, you have you use here, um, the input is again, acceleration, so the, the accelerometer data, 
um, and the time of day. So you have some temporal information. And here you have, again, like one of the first slides I've shown you, a CNN, set, set of CNN layer, convolutional neural network layer, and some gated recurrent um, unit or recurrent neural network layer. So these are the temporal, um, like in, I think it was slide two or slide three. We have a temporal set of layer that is able to consider temporal dependencies of that. Now, what we do here is that instead of using, you know, um, let's say this, this is a task, it's not written here, but let, let's, uh, I'm telling you that this is a task that uh, takes a kilometer data and tries to predict heart rate. Okay, this is the prediction task here. And if of this task, we take the penultimate layer and uh, use the, the parameters, the embeddings that we have found here um, and use these features, and we extract them at um, window level, then we applied a simple linear classifier to it to predict the demographics. Um, this works very well. So what we're saying is that by using a model that is trained to um, aim at a forecast hash rate task, we can also learn something, the model has learned something about the demographics of the users. And this is kind of intuitive if you think about it, because the demographics are very important in terms of fitness. And so uh, heart rate and acceleration are related because of that, but they're related also in terms of these dimensions. And in this slides, I will just show you how, um, how this is uh, predicted. So, um, these are the various um, approaches using just acceleration, acceleration time, acceleration and heart and resting heart rate, acceleration, resting heart rate and time. Um, and this is for the task of predicting heart rate, which in this particular case, we don't, we don't care much, but this is mean square error, root mean square error, and um, um, maximum absolute um, error on the mean, mean um, absolute error, sorry, on the, the things and then we have various baselines so we're doing quite well on this task but this was the main task and we're interested in the auxiliary task now here um what we do is they were trying to um collect information predict the information about height and weight and pe so energy expenditure this is another measure of uh, your activity weight, sex, age, BMI, which is your weight and resting heart rate. Um, and we see that, um, I'll, I'll explain PCA in a little, little while, but we see that we are generally quite good. We're not good at, pre at predicting this, but this technique is used at predicting, it's quite good at predicting these other measures. Um, some of them quite well, height and sex are the best. So now what is, um, what is this PCA? Uh, principal component analysis is a, is a technique that allows you to um, consider only a subset, so reduces the features that you're using, reduces the, uh, the dimensionality of the data. In this case, it kind of transforms the data in a different system. And uh, by this number here, the level of variance that you are able to consider if you have reduced the dimensionality. So here, they're all about 90%, so they, they really maintain the dimensionality of the data. It's often used also to um, explain, um, you know, data explainability in AI. And in fact, here is used to uh, reduce the dimensionality and show still the performance. Um, okay. And that um, ends um, this lecture. And uh, thank you very much.